Investors are facing a new reality. The longest bull market in history seems to be over. A double shock triggered by a global pandemic and an oil price war are firing off some of the biggest moves since the 2008 financial crisis. How should investors respond? If ever there are time for cool heads, it's now. Today we decided to lower interest rates. Hello, today I'm joined by Fidelity's Chief Investment Officer, Andrew McCaffrey, and the CIOs for Equity and Fixed Income, Romain Vauchy and Steve Ellis. Between them, we hope to answer questions clients are asking. Um, welcome to you all. Andrew, I'm going to uh, start with you, if I might, because um, you've been cautious about, uh, cautious about markets well before this virus um, hit, um, and certainly before the Saudi-Russia uh, row tanks the oil price. And I suppose the question is, um, was this a collapse that was waiting to happen? So I think there was a high level of complacency as we uh, came into the, in terms of uh, what the expectations around earnings, around the growth profile, and really the sort of bar that had been set um, for those expectations. I think what was interesting was the degree to which that complacency almost reached a new level in February as we saw the first signs of challenge to the global economy, and yet the markets continue to uh, bowl ahead. So I think that the opportunity for um, some resetting certainly uh, was there anyway. That's um, a nice way of putting it, an opportunity for resetting. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's looking pretty spectacular though. Um, where are the, are the main flows? So I think that the important thing to bear in mind so far has been how much we've seen hedging of um, exposures. And some of that is down to the challenges around liquidity in some of the underlying markets and securities. And so you've seen a lot of flows in synthetics, into um, you know, futures, into over-the-counter over type trading, just to try and um, give some management term to those exposures over a recent uh, week or two. Now the real challenge as we look ahead is how do we see positions play out as you start, start to think about do you want to maintain exposures overall um, and therefore have to unwind some of the underlying. At the moment, I think what has been very encouraging is the fact that we've seen actually little panic. So a lot of hedging, big volumes going through at times, but not really the sort of panic um, that one might expect given the price action. And, and not the big um, position changes, as you're saying, Roman, is that something you're, you, you, you'd agree with? Definitely, despite a new volatility regime, we are not facing a panic movement. So clients are remaining reasonably quiet. This is a very good news, even if, yes, we are facing a new investment regime, because now we have to price a recession. And, and how is it um, different, we'll, we'll come to that in a minute of course, but how is it different to previous um, crashes? Um, because you've got, uh, you're talking about the synthetic side of things, we've got algorithmic trading, there's um, much more indexing than, than there was before. What sort of impact um, are they having? In fact, I mean, why don't I ask you Steve? Yeah, so I think uh, that, that's, the, that's the key thing here, it is different because you know, this time we do have more ETS, we do have more algo trading, gamma hedging for example. So a large part of what we've seen, the moves that we've seen, have been driven by an unwind from, from the, these, uh, you know, the, the more technical side. And we, you know, we know that the, the liquidity position is very lopsided in markets in that you know, since the financial crisis there's been regulation put in place where the counterparties, the sell side banks effectively, have much lower tolerance in terms of their balance sheet to warehouse risk. And yet there's been huge amounts of money which has gone into into financial markets through ETFs, through mutual funds and so on. And so there's always a risk when you do get an unwind is that there's no, there's no counterparty there, no one to, to give you a bid to get out of this stuff. And I think there's been a confluence of events which have really triggered something of a, you know, liquidity really has just um, come to a standstill in the last few days. So how are you and, the, and your team, um, how are they managing this liquidity problem? Well, I think the first thing is that you, when you're managing portfolios, you have to make sure that you're running adequate levels of liquidity, meaning cash, cash equivalents, and so on. Um, we also monitor within the funds the, um, the relative liquidity position. We, there's many different ways you can measure the liquidity in a fund, but we use things like liquidity cost scores, how long it would take to trade a certain portion of the fund at a, tran a certain transaction cost, and so on. So every single day we're monitoring this, but the key thing that we're doing is making sure that we have the conviction in the fund, maintaining high levels of uh, liquidity so that is, as and when these markets do stabilise, we, we are in a position where we can take uh, advantage of this dislocation. Um, Roman, 
what are our team of analysts um, telling you about the conversations they're having with company management about the, the action that those companies are taking to defend themselves at, um, at these times? I think the, the, the bizarre thing is that people were really were prepared to, to manage scarcity and the crisis, the perfect storm, came from something abundant, oil. So this oil shock I, I, is really uh, uh, the perfect transmission mechanism from the coronavirus outbreak to the real economy. Because oil is not only impacting oil as such, it's impacting, of course, oil-related names, but it is impacting credit because oil is a significant chunk of the credit market, oil is impacting FX, and oil is also impacting the real economy because it's a significant, and by the way, positive shock for the consumer because it, it does, of course, uh, bring more uh, purchasing power for, for the consumer also. So can on, just on that, I think it's an important point that also we're seeing a very interesting um, development, even in the very short term, between what's happening in Asia and in China and the ability for, in some ways, for them to be getting sort of post the worst of the, uh, the virus impact, um, now getting a positive um, impact from oil as they are, uh, you know, those who are import and uh, to give that um, you know, little bit of help at the very difficult times. Okay, we're almost out of time, so I'm going to ask you each very briefly to tell me um, where do you think we're going to be in six months' time? Steve, let me start with you. Well, I think we're going to see a lot more um, policy response here. So I think cent central banks will, and the Fed are going to be cutting, ECB potentially cutting as well. So I think that's, um, that, that's going to, but it's going to be fairly impotent. But I think there has to be a fiscal response here. So I do think there will be a situation where I can see further problems in the short term, more dislocation of markets, real, inv real money investors could start to, to put, take some money out. But ultimately, you know, we're in, a, we're in an environment where yields would be extremely low at that point. Um, and uh, you know, there will be a search for yields. So I think high yield you know, will come back at some stage. But right now it's, it's too precarious. And Roman, with the, um, the policy action that Steve's talking about, whether it's fiscal or monetary, will that be enough to um, turn things around in six months' time? Do, uh, do you see a, a recovery? It could be enough to turn the tide at least from a market perspective, because valuations now are clearly already pricing a recession and people are still starving for yield. So it should help to preserve a decent level for equity prices. Having said that, we are remaining cautiously optimistic, which means that uh, we are preserving a quality bias. What uh, it does mean, it means that we are avoiding stocks with a significant leverage. Because when you are let cycle uh, from a credit cycle perspective, it's not time to buy leverage names. And Andrew, um, from your vantage point, um, what do you predict for the, uh, for, the, for the rest of the first half and as we go into the second? So I think it's a good point that Roman has just said around uh, leverage, that now you're really being told that uh, even though we've said for some time that you know, late cycle is going to be a dangerous place, I think it's been highlighted that um, you really do want to be focusing on that quality. Um, the other point, I think, is that until we start to see more evidence of what's playing out in the real economy and the direction of fiscal policy to really address the issues that are um, uh, you know, playing out from that, then I think that you know, markets can recover on the expectation of fiscal policy, but they'll be challenged through the next couple of quarters by um, how much that impacts and how much that um, you know, we start to see real role in uh, data come through uh, the global economy. So is it mind over matter or very much the data matters? We'll see. Um, Andrew, Roman and Steve, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and until next time, thank you for watching and goodbye. Today we decided to lower interest rates.